time you're tuning into this really good to see you and welcome uh, to our sunday service first of november i know we never thought that it would be this long and but you know something Uh, god has been with us throughout this journey and i trust that your hope is to be found in him i don't know about you it's been a, a difficult week in some ways not for anything directly personal to me but just some of the the sadness that you see all around and in our national news and international news again a sad sight in in paris and people uh, being murdered and um, for their faith i guess and um, people taking it out on them and such a sad sight to see and even earlier on in the week that sad sight that whole family and um, seeking refuge fleeing tyranny maybe in their own country and hoping for some hope in other countries and yet they find themselves um, a whole family wiped out and um, because they couldn't cross the channel and it broke my heart just to think that, that these people who so long to have freedom and so long to have renewed hope and something to live for and you know what in spite of all the lockdown and the pending lockdowns that we have, that, it, that there is nothing like the hope of Christ. And I trust that you know that hope this morning. I trust that you know that hope because in the darkness, in the, the deepest, darkest times, 
Christ as our only hope. And um, I trust you know that. And throughout the day, um, as we listen to our service, I'm sure that you're going to be encouraged by that as you listen to some songs. Uh, Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? A great song to start us off with. As we listen to God's word being preached, and it's brilliant that we've got Jeff Park with us, um, beginning a new series in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1 today, we'll read some of the verses together, or you will read them in your home um, shortly before Jeff preaches. But a brilliant book about real joy that comes from knowing Christ. Um, so get your Bibles ready uh, to hear what Jeff has got to say to us through God's word and pray that God's spirit will really encourage our hearts and challenge us um, that we may be sure that our hope is firmly fixed on Jesus Christ. And then, of course, good news yesterday, uh, Josh and Steph's wedding. Um, Thank you for your prayers on their behalf. Thank you for their good wishes on their behalf to us. And um, we just trust them in the Lord's hand in, in a moment or two. Um, there'll be some slides that you'll be able to see and a video explaining a little bit more about marriage and really the the, the crux of what marriage is and, and what it represents in the Bible. So I trust that you'll enjoy those things too. But before we do that, um, we're gonna I'm gonna pray for us, leaders in prayer, then an opportunity for you to pray at home and then join in together with by saying um, the Lord's Prayer. And again, pray for our country, pray for those in leadership, pray for those who, for for them, that are real sad and tough and lonely times. And pray that God will continue to build his church and will grow his church. And one last thing for me before I pray for us and lead our service off is remember this, no matter what you hear from your politicians, uh, wherever they are, whatever country they are, uh, that they're trying to save Christmas and rescue things so we can be ready for Christmas. No national leader has ever saved Christmas. Cast your mind back 2,000 years. Caesar Augustus, a census. Cast your mind back that same period of time, King Herod, longing to kill off Christmas. Listen, no national leader saves Christmas. What Christmas does, Christmas saves us through the birth, the incarnation, the coming of Jesus Christ, God becoming flesh, coming down this earth to save you and me, sinners. And what a great message of hope that is that we have where the lockdown leads us through Christmas or we finish before Christmas, however it is, we know that great message of Christmas, the incarnation of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And as the Christmas season begins, I guess, over these next number of weeks. Hold fast to that, that Christmas saved you, saved me in the person of Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us, lead us off in our service, and I trust you enjoy the rest of your day with us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the saving goodness of your grace upon us. Sinners, wretched, like me, who needed a rescuer, And thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. And we can celebrate that at Christmas. And as we build up to that whole period of Advent, and we pray that our eyes will be firmly fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Encourage us in these days, we pray. Lead us on and aright with you. And Lord, as we look at your word again today, we thank you so much for Jeff and his family, for every remembrance of them, for what they mean to us, for their ministry to us in the gospel. We pray that not only we will be blessed through hearing your word through Jeff today, but they too will be blessed wherever they are and that you will keep them. So thank you again, Lord, for gospel love. Thank you for partners in the gospel because of Christ. So we commit ourselves, the rest of our service into your hands. And we pray that as we pray together now in our homes, separately but united in Christ, that you'll be pleased to hear our prayers for the glory and the honour of your name. Amen.
Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Symbols, shadows, parables. Sometimes this is about that. Flowers are about love. Signatures are about promises. Fireworks are about celebrations. Poppies are about war. And marriage is about the Christian gospel. This mystery is profound, says Paul, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So the wedding begins with the groom waiting at the front. He has pursued his bride and won her, and now he just has to wait. And when she eventually comes in, the whole room stands and stares at her beauty, her immaculate dress, pure and white and spotless. She gets presented to him and they declare that they have no other partners. They hold hands. They make promises to have and to hold for better, for worse, forsaking all others as long as we both shall live. They exchange rings, signs of the covenant promises they have just made. They sign their names and make their vows legal. Then, as the ceremony concludes, they walk back out again, united as one. Everything he has is hers, and everything she has is his. Everybody celebrates with a meal. Later, they will express their physical union and share all of their possessions. She even takes on his name. Two have become one. And all this is about that. Jesus has made his people ready. His death for our sins has made us beautiful, pure, white, and spotless. We are given to him and to nobody else. We make promises to each other. Never will I leave you or abandon you, says Jesus, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. And we reply to him, I will forsake all other gods as long as we both shall live. There is an exchange of gifts. God gives us his spirit. There is a legal declaration. God says we are righteous in his sight. We walk on, united as one. Everything he has, his love, his power, his goodness, becomes ours. And everything we have, our sin, our shame, our past, becomes his. Everybody celebrates with a meal, bread and wine. We express our physical union through baptism in water. We give him access to all our possessions. We even take on his name and his identity. We become Christians. Two have become one. This is about that. Oh, my soul, 
rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear.
morning it's good to be with you I wish I could be there in person but as we know that's not possible so we're gonna to have to make do with the screen greetings to you all from myself and from Jean we've known many of you for many years and you're good friends we love you and God willing we'll be able to meet up again soon I'm going to look at the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians for the next four weeks Handily, there are four chapters, so we can look at a chapter a week. I'm going to call the series, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. So perhaps you'd get yourself a Bible or a New Testament now, that'd be good, and find the letter, and also find, if you would, Acts chapter 16. Because Acts chapter 16 is gives us the record of the birth of the church in Philippi. It's a wonderful story how Paul thought he was going to go one way, but then went in the opposite direction, guided by the Holy Spirit to Philippi. And when he arrived in Philippi, he met a number of people who ultimately were converted and became the founder members of the church in Philippi. We meet in Acts 16, Lydia, we meet a jailer and we meet a slave girl and they surely were those founder members along with others. I'm going to call this series The Joy of the Lord is My Strength and I'm going to call this first chapter Locked Down but Not Tongue Tied. Paul's writing this letter to the Philippians 10 years after the birth of the church there. He's in Rome, he's under lockdown, in fact he's locked up, he's under house arrest in Rome chained 24 7 to a roman soldier so circumstances are not easy to say the least timothy who's been a companion on many of his journeys and throughout his ministry timothy's often with him in rome to help him to support him to bring perhaps some home comforts and certainly to encourage him timothy himself is not under house arrest but he's willing to identify with paul in those circumstances Paul writes this letter to encourage the people in Philippi whom he loves and for whom he prays regularly. As we know, as I've just said, he's under house arrest. In fact, in this letter, he'll mention his chains more than once. But it's not a woe is me letter at all. He's not looking inwardly. He's not navel gazing. He's remembering with affection the times he spent with the Christians there in Philippi. And he reminds them how often he is praying for them and he wants to encourage them through this letter. As I've said, it's not a letter that homes in on Paul himself, but rather it's a letter full of several elements. The main element, as it were, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll find that 18 times in this first chapter alone, Paul mentions the Lord Jesus. He either calls him Christ Jesus or Jesus or the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only a short chapter, but there they are, 18 references to Christ. And the other element that's important in this letter is that of joy or the verb rejoice, which is linked to it. Four times we come across the words, altogether over a dozen times in the letter. Paul is writing from his desk, his table there in under house arrest, and he wants to be the person whom perhaps more than any other will encourage the folks there in Philippi. Notice how he starts the letter. He says he's a bond slave or a servant of Christ Jesus. He's not his own. He's not now going to make his own decisions. Well, he can't in lots of ways because of his house arrest. But he's always going to be submissive to the will of God. He's always going to do what the master says. And that's what characterised him throughout his ministry. That's why he ended up going to Philippi. He would, have, he would have wanted to go elsewhere. He did want to go elsewhere, but he ended up going to Philippi because we're told at the beginning of Acts 16 that the Holy Spirit directed him to go there. So Paul is a servant, he's a bond slave, and that's how he introduces himself to the brothers and sisters in Philippi. But he wants to show them 
that we can have joy in the Lord, whatever our circumstances. Now, it'd be good at this point, just as a little aside, to understand what joy means in a Bible context. Joy and happiness aren't necessarily the same things. Happiness can be an emotion, can be a, a feeling, a reaction that can be momentary, that can last for some time. We may have a success, we may have a promotion, we may have good news, good news in the family, in our job, in our studies, whatever it is. And it's, happiness is often associated, surely, with an emotional reaction. Joy, the joy that Paul mentions, the joy that Paul homes in on, is something different. Just let me give you one or two indications of what he's talking about from elsewhere in the Bible. Joy, according to one of the Psalms, Psalm 4, is a gift from God. According to Luke, God grants it to those who believe the gospel. According to Romans 14, joy is produced by the Holy Spirit. According to Jeremiah in the Old Testament, joy is experienced most fully as believers receive and obey God's word. According to James, believers' joy is deepened through trials. That would certainly resonate with Paul. And according to 1 Peter, a believer's joy is made complete when he or she sets their hopes on the glory of heaven. So how is it that Paul can bring that element into his letter? Precisely because he understands what it is and understands particularly that it's an acceptance of the sovereignty of God. He accepts that God doesn't play around with him or with us. He accepts that things come our way that we may not have chosen, which God in his sovereignty permits, but that will ultimately redound to our good, but to his glory. These are so important. Uh, these are such important truths to understand. And in this first chapter, which I said we're going to call Lockdown But Not Tongue Tied, I want to just bring to you three aspects of the joy that Paul wants to share with the Christians in, Philipp in Philippi through this first chapter in order to encourage them. First of all, would you look at verse 4? I th well, three, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Joy in remembrance of them, joy in knowing that they're fellow believers, joy of knowing that they're going through the same experience and they have the same prospects that Paul himself has. Notice what he says. I pray with joy, verse 4, now going into 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So they're going on. The church was born 10 years ago, but it's still going on. There are those who are growing in their faith, who are maturing in their faith. Look at this, verse 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. I am convinced you're going to make it to the end. It's not how we start that matters, it's how we finish. That's what Paul's saying, and I'm confident that you're going to make it to the end. What a thrill it must be as he thinks back to those days, 10 years ago when he first arrived in Philippi, and now the church has grown and folks have matured, and he can say this to himself, I'm going to go to heaven with some of those people. I'll be taking Lydia and the jailer, the slave girl and many others to heaven with me. What an encouragement that is, not because of him, but because of whom? Because of Christ Jesus. That's a real source of joy to Paul. What's the second source of joy in this chapter? Well, he said, tells us in verse 12. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, you brothers and sisters there in Philippi, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Not, oh, this isn't fair, I should never have had to go through this, and he could perhaps think of times when he'd been elsewhere, we read of in the book of Acts, when he'd been stoned, when he'd been shipwrecked, when he'd been flogged, when all sorts of things had come his way. He doesn't tell me in on anything like that. I want you to know that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. How come? 13. 
As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Just apply a little bit of imagination to Paul's situation. Chained to a soldier 24-7. I wonder what it was like for a soldier to be on duty with Paul. I wonder when it was their turn to be with him, they either relished the prospect or thought, oh no, not him again. I know what I'm going to get, an ear bashing about the gospel. Whoever was chained to Paul heard the gospel. He had a captive audience. He was captive, but he had a captive audience himself. And he says here, as a result of my imprisonment, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else, I'm in chains for Christ. The palace guard actually numbered 900 in total. They took it in turns to guard prisoners. They had six hour stints. Imagine what Paul could share with his um, captors, with the soldiers during that time. And when you get to chapter four of this letter, we find that actually, certainly some of them had become Christians. What an opportunity Paul had had. So one of the reasons he has joy is that although he's restricted, although he's imprisoned, he's got an audience right there in front of him, a congregation that comes to him. 14. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. He had inspired and was inspiring other Christians as they heard what was going on under his house arrest themselves to preach the gospel. Courage had made others copy what Paul had done, had given them the courage to copy what Paul had done and to emulate his ministry. They were preaching the gospel too. Folks who beforehand had lacked that courage, now they were imitating as it were what Paul was doing well if he can do it we most certainly can do it and so they did so he was encouraged himself and encouraging others and in that he found joy there were some however who were being naughty they were taking the opportunity of Paul's imprisonment to actually sort of muscle in on ministry they wanted to perhaps oust him they wanted perhaps to have a name for themselves they wanted to perhaps um, outdo Paul in anything that he claimed that he was doing as a as a minister as a missionary they wanted to perhaps go even better but they were motivated says Paul by ego by the wrong desires and yet he concludes the following but what does it matter verse 18 the important thing is that in every way whether from false motives or true Christ is preached so his sources of joy were the Philippian Christians who he remembers fondly, the fact that the gospel is being preached and there are converts even within the guards. And then there's another prospect of joy. He doesn't know if he'll be released. He doesn't know if he's going to be executed. He doesn't know what the Lord is going to give um, to him in the future. But he says this, verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, that is, that I will lose heart, that I will become almost perhaps an embarrassment, I don't know, because of the way that he might uh, act, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Here we go. Everybody knows this verse. Put it in the context of Paul's experience. For me, to live is Christ. I'll obey him. I'm his bondservant. Not one guard will leave my room without knowing what the gospel is. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Am I going to get free, be set free? Am I going to be executed? This is the reason for my joy. I'm going to heaven. I'm torn between the two, verse 23. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. I prefer to stay. I can help you. I can encourage you. I can keep on writing to you. I have opportunities to write more letters to you. Look at this, verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. 
if I am spared, you'll have increased joy, and so will I. If I'm not spared, I'm going to be with Christ, which is far better. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Real, lasting joy. Lockdown, yes. Tongue-tied, not at all. No God could escape a sermon from Paul. I actually think most of them probably relish the prospect of being with them, actually. Some would have balked, I'm sure. But I'm sure some of them felt I'd love to be with him today. Many were converted, gave Paul great joy. Okay, let's challenge ourselves. Do we understand anything of that joy that Paul had? Are you a Christian? Are you going to heaven? Am I going to heaven? What a prospect that is. With Christ is far better, far better than anything this world affords. But while we're here, what are you doing about for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Are you sharing the gospel? Am I? Who are you taking to heaven with you? Who are you praying to take to heaven with you? Are you just keeping the gospel to yourself? I'm retired now. I've been retired six years. I've determined I don't want to go to heaven without taking somebody else with me. I meet up with ex-students of mine. I meet up with locals and share the gospel with them. Not consistently, not effectively so far, but I pray for them and I want them to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ themselves as Lord and Saviour. This chapter is joyful, full of joy. It is Christ-filled and it is also gospel-filled. Look how many times the word gospel is mentioned. And don't forget this. Gospel, good news. The good news is a person. It's a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope this has helped. I find this a very difficult experience because when you record yourself doing one of these talks, all you can do is see yourself. And I find that acutely embarrassing. You probably do as you've been watching. Forget me, forget the picture. Home in on this wonderful chapter, chapter of joy. Locked down, but not tongue-tied. Are you? Am I? Are we those who are willing to go to others with the gospel while there is still time so that we can take others to heaven with us and be encouraged by the fact that they come to know the Lord as their saviour. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Though the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you.
times my 